we can. And by yeah. the way, we're all recording now, guys. So if you make any ugly faces in the camera, it'll be on YouTube. Um, <laughs> and if you guys don't want your face on, I totally get that. Um, my hair is beginning to look more and more like Ace Ventura every day. Uh, you can just throw on the little stop video thing. But um, so, guys, yeah, meet Lizzie Bailey. Um, Lizzie, just a couple things I wanted to start asking you. Let's get started just kind of asking a little bit about yourself. Um, you grew up playing music, of course. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I grew up, I was one of nine siblings in Georgia. Did you say nine? Uh, yeah. We were a big old weird homeschool family. Um, but we, my mom is a classical pianist and my dad, um, is a preacher, but before he was a preacher, he was a like music director in a church. Okay. Um, and so is the sound okay or do you want me to try these headphones? Yeah, we're doing a little bit better. I think we I think okay. we're good guys. Throw, throw us some comments. If the sound's not great, we'll just stick with this. If it's not, maybe just keep those headphones nearby in case Lizzie. Thank you. Okay. Um, so anyway, I, just grew up like hearing all kinds of music. I heard tons of classical music from my mom. She taught me to play piano and, and forced me to learn how to read music. And, um, and then my dad had this big old kind of opera type voice, uh, you know, big booming voice and just sang all the time, but he loved seventies rock. He was kind of a hippie. So I had a good, uh, exposure to music from a young age, just all kinds of music, all varieties. So I think that's a really big part of any musician is just getting exposed to um, all kinds of music and learning to appreciate it and recognize the, the things that make each genre what, what they are. Uh, and so I learned piano and then my older sister randomly uh, bought me a violin, a little cheap violin when I was 12. So I learned to play that. And then I didn't learn guitar until I was an adult. I was like in my late twenties. Um, I just wanted something, a different way to write. So I was kind of stuck with piano. And Did you uh, get tired of hauling a piano around? <laughs> the portability of a guitar is it's, really very nice. That common sense is strong. It is. Yeah, totally. So um, I just can't play music, and now I am a worship pastor and worship leader and write songs and record them, too, and all that. So when did you start writing songs? And I guess my question is, was there a time when it was kind of unofficial, and then there was a time that it became, hey, I do this, and here's my music? And what, oh, what, is, what were those ages? Well, I started writing poetry before I ever wrote a song when I was like mid teens, probably 13, 14, started writing poetry because songs are just poems put to music. Uh, and then um, started kind of making little songs when I was a teenager. When I was 15, I recorded my first like official song just because this friend of mine offered to do it, you know for us to go in the studio and it was a terrible song and you're gonna you're gonna play that song for us today right <laughs> i don't even know where it is i don't know if i could find it if no I we found to. it we're gonna play it today oh good That's well it'll it'll give you all hope it'll impress. <laughs> yeah totally so yeah i just did it for for fun for a long time and um yeah i don't it was a gradual shift into you know people actually saying we'll we'll pay you to come play your songs and, or, you know, we'll pay to buy your CD or whatever. That was a gradual shift. So I met you um, when we were in our 20s. You and Matthew, your husband, came and led worship at my church. When mm -hmm. did that start happening? Because you guys were a worship duo, but you weren't just covering songs. You were writing your own songs. So we'll just call that a songwriting duo just for the sake of this class. When did that begin, you and Matthew writing songs together? Uh, from the time we met, uh, when we met, he was leading worship and I was leading worship. And then we 
fell in love and got married and just started leading worship together and writing songs together and um, just had a couple of different opportunities to record those songs and make CDs and, and then we'd go play them at churches and uh, stuff like that. Awesome. Cool. So my next question uh, for you guys who may not know this about Lizzie, she also has five kids. So they have at least what I consider to be a pretty big family. And all of them are really dynamite musicians also. Um, so their names, why don't you give us their names and ages, if you don't mind, because I kind of have a point to this, Lizzie. Yeah, sure. Um, Ezra is our oldest. He's 19. Silas is 16. Lyric is 15. Sunny is 13. And Daisy is 9. And did you ever sit them down and start teaching them music, or was it kind of an osmosis thing? Uh, it's a combo. So when they were young, uh, I taught them all sort of, sort of the basics on piano, taught them how to read music, um, and they stuck with it to varying degrees. Some of them were like, when can we stop? Some of them kind of kept going with it. Um, and then, so part of it was sort of, formal intentional instruction uh part of it has been they just you know my oldest son just figured out some things we showed him some basics on guitar and then he would uh learn here and there and watch us i mean it's hard to know what's what because they were always going with us to churches to lead worship and and sitting around and listening and watching live bands and so i'm sure they picked up a lot just from being around it um, but then they've, they've also made choices to pursue different instruments, learn different instruments. Yeah. Awesome. And so, you know, for you guys, I think kind of my thing of bringing that up is I've met all of the five Bailey. They're all awesome. And a lot of times, you know, they, they kind of have a similar story with me where I just sort of learn songwriting from being around people. And I think sometimes we think that a degree is actually what validates, oh, well, now it's okay to start writing songs. When in reality, a degree just represents the fact that we've gone through some training and we might have those tools now. But hopefully for you guys, someplace like the rehearsal room or something, if you don't have a family that's super musical, can kind of be that for you. You hang out with us, you learn some things. And when it comes to songwriting, you're really only going to use what you need. You don't have to learn everything because you're not going to use everything. You know, like I know even, you know, for Lizzie, uh, one of the things I love about her is when I make my records, I, you know, if I have a song that's like, oh, well, this has a violin on it, we'll call Lizzie because she can do that. Or, oh, now I need a background. Like she can kind of do all these things. That's great. Lizzie probably doesn't need a huge um, skill set in like how to make electronic dance music. <laughs> like that's not in her songwriting deal. So I think what I'm trying to say is you guys find a group of people that you can be around and you're going to learn only what you need to do. And it's probably going to be enough, if that makes sense. Because I see her family and I just go, wow, they're all so talented. And they've all just kind of learned it from one another, et cetera, et cetera. So, so anyway, uh, Lizzie, thanks for letting me kind of just talk a little bit about your, about your crew and things like that. I wanted to ask you one thing about your, you know, your songwriting. You have, uh, you work through a variety of vehicles. You've got... Faith Bridge, which is a church that you play at on Sunday morning. Sometimes those are your songs that you're leading a couple thousand people in, which is really cool. Uh, you have music videos you've made. You have Instagram, which is a must follow. If you guys follow Instagram or your own Instagram, Lizzie takes cool photos and they're always really pretty. They make your day better. And um, it's not just food. Um, and uh, you have your records, and then you also play live shows as a songwriter and a storyteller, not only in the more religious outfit like worship reading. Uh, am I leaving anything out? I think that's about it. That's a lot of stuff, right? So you kind of started pursuing all those things. Was there any one of those that was the scariest? Oh, for sure, performing as an artist. Because okay. I've been leading worship since I was like 16, and I always felt like that was 
valid, you know, it's like, oh, this is a need in the church. Uh, you know, people are asking me to do this. They're saying, please come lead worship for this thing. And so I, I never really questioned if that was valid um, since I was very young. And I almost felt like that was uh, a more, like a better thing to do. Bye, thank you. Uh, like that was... I don't know, like morally better than just being a songwriter, singer, you know, like, oh, that's just sort of self-indulgent. We don't need more songwriters. When I was younger, I felt that way. I didn't really understand the need for art and what it really does for people and how valid it is. And um, so it was definitely a fight to get me even to perform my songs because it was like, I don't know, I just felt self-conscious and I wasn't convinced it was worthy, I guess. Um, so that was a much longer process to get to where I felt like, oh, I believe in this and I'm going to do this. Well, was, was the thing that you, and I'm really trying to use your words here, not my own, <clears throat> the, the notion of higher or lower music, was that mm -hmm. taught to you by somebody? Or did I you think just was, kind of get there by yourself? Because I got there too, and I don't know how. Yeah, I think it was just growing up in, I was just in church all the time. And that was my world and my culture. And I personally experienced worship and how it was very meaningful to me and impactful for me. And so it was like, oh yeah, this is good. This is something that needs to happen. Um, and even though I had experienced that from other artists as well, I mean, I had experienced music changed my life. I mean, Beethoven changed my life, you know, but for some reason I separated like the sacred and the non-sacred when I was younger. And I, and as I got older and learned more, I realized, no, everything is sacred and everything, there's beauty everywhere. And God uses all kinds of art and music and lyrics. And it's not like, the good church music and then the, the evil secular music, you know? You know, I, I, I would really love to just kind of put a stake in the ground there and speak kind of from my perspective. Something that was taught to me as a musician was um, when someone began to kind of reverse that, which I hope to do for some of you guys out there, that if it comes from you, can it be any more or less sacred? Like, I only do what I do. And so I'm not, sometimes I obviously may say things that aren't as nice to one person as they could be to the other. But music has a weird way of doing what it wants to do all by itself. Whether you want to call that music or God or universe. And what really set me free as a songwriter is to realize, oh, uh, I got good stuff inside and I'm going to let it out and trust that it's going to need to go where it needs to go. The why, I can't really worry about. I'm going to worry about the what. I'm going to worry about the G minor or the, and, 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 and the why, I'm going to leave that up to, you know, for me and my faith, I know I share that with you with Lizzie I'm gonna leave that up to you know my heavenly father he's gonna know what to do with that um try not to outthink him so um well that's cool guys I, I hope that was kind of encouraging to hear that you know you know from Lizzie that uh well I and the follow-up question is you know Lizzie you do still perform at places around here does it go away to get up in front of a smaller crowd or a larger crowd and play one of your own songs is that a hundred percent easy now is it 100% hard? Is it somewhere in the middle? Um, I mean, it's definitely generally much easier than it used to be. I mean, I believe in it now. That's the thing. You got to believe in what you're doing. You can't mm -hmm. let people know if you're faking it. Um, so it's, it's, I'm definitely, it, there was a, a, you know, long, gradual incline where you're just stumbling around and you're getting out there and you're like, this ain't that great, but I'm just going to do it anyway. <laughs> you know, because somebody said I could, so I'm just, I mean, confidence, you need it. You just, you have to have it as a performer. You, you will never be perfect technically. You got to just fake it till you make it. I mean, not entirely. You got to have some traps and you got to work your butt off and all that. But 
you got to just go do it. And so after the, the, the first little while of like, I just learned how to play guitar and I'm pretending like I know what I'm doing, but I really have no idea. Um, I, I'm definitely, I've gotten more and more comfortable, but it's a process. I mean, it wasn't immediate for sure. Did, <clears throat> if you do struggle, what would be your advice to people who are either sharing their first song on an Instagram feed or a, a SoundCloud account or iTunes or maybe playing at an open mic. Do you have, I don't want to call it a tactic or a tip or advice, but something that maybe the younger first timers could begin to take away and write down on a napkin and throw in their guitar case. Mm -hmm. Well, practically you just need to know it without thinking. Don't perform unless you at least know the song. I mean, like I said a minute ago, I mean, I was kind of faking it, but I practiced a lot. I mean, I got to the point where I could play without thinking, what's the next chord, what's the next lyric? And you practice, you practice, you practice. And then once you can do it without thinking, when the nerves come in, which they will, you have enough muscle memory to kind of still be able to do it and not appear nervous. So. I mean, the practical part of that is you just have to practice and know your stuff uh, before you're going to perform it. And then once you feel like I can do this without hesitation, I can go through it perfectly every time, then you show it to somebody and share it with somebody. I, and I just mean in a public way. You can obviously share it with trusted friends or whoever is in your circle when it's very raw and unformed. But, um, yeah, so, so practice, know it, and then, I mean, just don't worry about it if you fail sometimes. I mean, you, musicians sometimes, y'all, we're just big babies. you got to get some thick skin. you got to ha have some people that you trust enough to say. Like, I have some friends that I'll send stuff to, and they'll go, I don't really like that, you know? Oh, and I'll do, that, I'll do that for them. And... That is such a great exercise because you don't want people who are just like, oh, it's so great, everything you do is great, because you're not going to improve. you got to get over being afraid of criticism. you you got to recognize everybody writes crappy songs. Everybody writes songs that are just okay. And just keep doing it because it's all part of getting to where hopefully you're writing better songs and more better songs and all of that. I don't know many songwriters who practice a little bit more perform a little bit more and write a little bit more and somehow digress. Right. <laughs> like unless there's some kind of substance abuse or something in the mix here and some lifestyle choice, like generally if you do, you get better. So that's encouraging. Yeah. Um, and if you, you know, if you are having a problem where you practice a ton and you are getting better and you're, and you are getting worse, I don't really, you know, we, we'll figure that out for you later. Um, <laughs> So guys, <laughs> at this point, uh, we're going to do two things. Number one, we're going to play some Elizabeth's music here. There's a song I want to talk to you guys about called Healer. And um, it's one of my favorite songs by Lizzie. Um, I'll tell you why in a second. While we're playing the songs, if questions come to mind, please throw them in. And we'll kind of try to address them. Because honestly, your personal questions are more important. Um, you guys probably don't have a ton of access to Lizzie Bailey. She's a busy woman. She has five children. I have begged her to teach at the rehearsal room on two occasions, and both she has says no. And, uh, you know, she's a professional worship leader, as we talked about. This is a really neat opportunity for you, you know, if anything comes to mind, you know, that, that you want to get to chat with her about. And then second, uh, if you have questions about the song, don't be embarrassed if you think it might be, quote, unquote, too dumb. It's not too dumb. Uh, I'm not doing my job if I'm not, you're walking away from this, not feeling like, oh, I know, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to write this thing. So here we go, guys. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share this screen here. And um, what I'd like to do is um, hopefully as I play this, um, you guys will all be able to hear Healer. And if you can't, just give me a thumbs down real quick, okay? But I'm going to go ahead and play healer here. And if you'll notice, we've got 
a few, um, we got a few charts out here. One of these has numbers on it, and that may be a little foreign to you guys. One of these doesn't. It's really the same chart. And in music, we have this thing called music theory where we can assign numbers to chords, and it makes writing much simpler. I don't expect you guys to understand that today, but I thought I'd introduce it so that we can begin to recognize patterns. So that's what I want us to look at, is look at the patterns. If you can't understand the chords, look at the numbers. Secondly, these little guys right here where you see these extra little M7s and stuff like that, if that confuses you, don't worry about it. That's just noise. We, you know, that's like sugar and spice in music. It just kind of adds a little extra something. The main thing are, the, are those, those block numbers. That's what we're going to kind of pay attention to as we go through this. So here we go. Here is Healer. Um, let me make sure my volume's all right. Let's start at middle volume, and you guys can give me a thumbs up if it's good. Can we get a thumbs up if you guys can hear this? Good job. We are people in need of grace We are bound by all our mistakes Here in our weakness can you bring your strength We are in need, we are in need We lift our soul to you You come and restore the things that have been lost. We have no life except the life you give. Healer, heal us. You are gracious in all your ways. Your compassion is No. 
Okay, guys, since she can't hear you, visual, visual applause, please. Visual applause. What a killer song. I'm going to turn Lizzie back on. We've got some questions. Um, all right, let's see here. Oh, we've got some people freezing. Oh, no. Oh, no. This is not good. Oh. Let's see if I've got you guys back, and we do. Okay, good. I thought I lost that whole class there. That would have been a bad day. No! <laughs> exactly. Um, great job. I love that. Um, for many of you guys, um, you can send in your emails to Lizzie. Just go find her website and complain to her because she actually does not have that song online. And it is a crime. I'm trying to mute Lizzie and mute everybody else. Because <laughs> I called her and I was like, hey, we got to do this song. She's like, yeah, yeah, that one's not all bad. <laughs> I know, I need to re release it. Re release it. I, uh, when I played piano at Faith Bridge, <clears throat> they m would move us around. They have multiple leaders, and I would move around, and sometimes I'd get to where I'd play with Lizzie and Matthew and I'd see Healer on there. I'd be like, yes! Um, so there's a couple things I want to talk at, talk about. I'm going to throw Lizzie up here before we... It's like a ghost or something in there. I know. Um, Ninja. There we go. Got to put it back up. And uh, first off... Um, I guess, you know what, maybe let's do these questions first, and then I'll get to the technical stuff. So, Victoria has the first question. She says she loves the drums. Is that a shuffle beat? How did you choose what the drums would sound like, Lizzie? Well, I'm going to be honest. Um, there is a song by David Gray called we Please Forgive Me. <laughs> and we pretty much ripped him off. I mean... I'm not going to lie. He has the long sustained chords and a quick brushy drum thing like that. I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's certainly inspired. I got to give credit where credit is due. Um, it certainly inspired the vibe. I mean, it's a, it's a different song. If you listen to the song, which is an amazing song, one of my favorite songs called Please Forgive Me by David Gray. Um, but I love that song. I didn't intentionally go, I'm going to copy that. But when I was writing Healer, I just heard, I was like, we need that quick, brushy, shuffly vibe. So, yeah, um, we really agree. Could we, can we hit a pause real quick on that? Because that's something I want to just impart as a mentor here at the rehearsal room. That is okay with the world, by the yeah, way. Yeah, it's okay. I promise you that, um, and we're going to pull this up, actually, that David Gray was in the studio and he was thinking of someone else's drum beat. That sure. It's just passed along, guys. And yeah, it's not okay if you come out with a song called Hit Me Baby One More Time and you <laughs> and decide to dress up like, yeah, like that's not okay. But what I want to point out is we are going to pull up the song. You're going to recognize the drum beat, but then you're going to hear it and you're like, yeah, please, like, it doesn't sound like Lizzie's song. There's just kind of that inference there. So let's, let's do that because I want to encourage you guys to do that same exact thing. Okay, so here's David Gray's song. So you kind of Please forgive me if I act strange i mean it's there but if i heard that song would i go oh my gosh she's just doing david Gray. no and in fact i love white ladder it's one of my favorite records so good he was okay. better that's i like that song better <laughs> I, i'm just no saying way. you know now i'm not going to pay yeah. 55 dollars to go see lizzie at red rocks but you know, <laughs> i'm like you better because her husband me and i neither. are bros so i'm like matthew you better get me in but yeah. the point is that's there. Hey, that was a really good question, Victoria. Thank you so much. Are you a drummer, by the way? Where's Victoria? 
Where'd she go? She's a musical her. expert in oh, every way. Oh, musical expert. I'm trying to find her here. I might Victoria go actually does management and booking for me. Really? And she's incredible. And she understands and loves music and just an all around fantastic. Victoria, you're unmuted if you want to chime in here. Oh, I'm anything? just a. I, I can't play anything, but I love music. All right. Well, yeah, she's that was a connoisseur. A great a connoisseur. Well, it's good to he meet you. He tells me if something sucks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So now we're going over to Cindy. Um, assuming that you wrote the poetry, which I'm guessing you did, uh, did Matthew and you write it or was it you by yourself, Lizzie? Yeah. Well, um, I wrote the song. Matthew wrote the bridge. Okay. Uh, it's pretty cool. So it was definitely a co, uh, co-write, but yeah, he wrote the bridge. I wrote everything else. So she wants to know, assuming that you wrote the poetry first and then added a melody, how much reshaping of the lyrics came up? How much of that was necessary, I guess, what she's asking, to fit the original poetry into that <laughs> melody? How did those two things kind of marry together? If you remember, I know it was a while ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. If um. I rarely r write a strict poem and then like completely devoid of music. I rarely do that. So it's usually simultaneous music and lyric or, you know, or some combination of the two happening simultaneously. So if I remember correctly, that was definitely, I mean, I remember sitting down to play and just kind of, you know, that was a song that they both happened together it wasn't a lyrics first music second uh process on that one sometimes it. it's it's heavier that you know i'll write a lot of lyrics and then put music to it but usually it's both and <clears throat> and if guys i could piggyback off that for the younger songwriters or the first timers you know a lot of times um and i'm gonna let's go ahead and pull up her um let's pull up that bridge that she talked about with matthew so here I'm looking at this bridge here. We're calling for grace, calling for mercy, calling for love, calling for you. And then he, they literally repeat that. Now, honestly speaking, that, that doesn't, I don't want to choose my words carefully because this is my favorite part of the song. What I'm trying to say is it disguises itself as a very ordinary thing you're saying. Like that's completely conversational. We're not, there are no thou's and thou arts and it, it's just talking. And when you begin to simply hum something underneath it, melody and lyric come together. And what Lizzie is an expert in doing is something that I promise you can do right now. If you just sit down with some, a phrase just like this one, that comes from the heart, calling for grace, calling for mercy, calling for love, calling for you, and just hum it to yourself. You'll be very surprised at how something that, that can be super simple, that when you put it to a melody that you enjoy singing, now meaning really comes together for it. And of course, yeah, will it be as good as Healer the first time? If it is, you owe me money. But if it's not, <laughs> just keep writing, and it's going to get there. It's going to get there. That was great. Let's keep going with these questions on Healer. Guys, feel free to throw more in. Um, the next one, Marissa. Um, now, Marissa, you sent this in privately. Um, let, me, let me see where you are, because I want to give a thumbs up that this is okay if I read this. Okay, thumbs up. Um, I've started writing originals about five months ago. Good for you. Uh, my biggest question is, how can I start getting things recorded and produced with limited access to instruments? Okay, um, this actually, Marissa, I'm so glad you asked this because this is going to go into a later question I'm going to go ahead and ask Lizzie about now. And then I'd like to give you my suggestion that the rehearsal room wants to offer you. Lizzie, how do you go about taking the music and i don't i don't mean in the long run but i mean it's just in your head and it's just on a guitar what's the very next thing that's a recorded something well here's here's so um you write a song because you want to write a song 
right? Just like you paint a picture because you want to paint a picture. Right. And then you paint another picture and you write another song because it's in you to do it and you just do it. Uh, generally, that's how it works. You don't do it to make money or to do this or that. It's not a means to an end. Art should just be art for its own sake. So what happens next is hopefully you have a community of people. Maybe you have some church friends and you lead worship for the small group and you, and they say, Oh, you can sing. Oh, you can play an instrument. And, and you, so you share the gift, right? How, how, in whatever way it makes sense. Maybe you should have an Instagram you share it on there. Maybe you have Facebook you share it on there. So wherever it makes sense to share your art, you do that. And then Here's the thing. The thing about music and getting music recorded, you pretty much can't do anything by yourself unless you just have a ton of money and you can just go to the studio and, and say, here's what I want to do. I'm going to pay all the musicians. I'm going to pay the production, you know, and it's very expensive. And, um, but, but rather it usually grows organically. And so, you know, in my experience, it's been, you need other people who recognize, Hey, this is good this will, this will make this group better, or this will fit with this event, or would you sing this here? Or I like that. I want to play that at my church, you know, and you have to have other people that what I'm saying is you have to have other people who recognize, um, and will help you grow. So like Keaton said at the very beginning, you need a community. You need a community of people who will not only help you get better because they will, but who will, who, you know, if you have a gift and you're getting better and it's something that will bless other people, you need other people helping you and saying, oh, let me play guitar on that for you. Let me play keys on that for you. Let's get together and write a song or whatever. It, in my experience, it's always been, you know, other people have always been involved. It's never just been me making something happen. Um, I wouldn't even know how, I mean... I guess you could just hire somebody to do everything, but I don't have enough money for that. So what does that make of, sense? Yeah. And what kinds of technology do you use before you call those people to, you know, like, are, is there something on your phone that you feel comfortable enough saying, oh man, this was easy for me. I downloaded it and I used it the first time. Oh, well, if you're just, if you're just doing like, so like for my, when I do Instagram live videos or something, um, I have a little sure mic that I clip to my phone that just makes everything sound better. I'm using it right now. Um, or I would show it to you, but it's plugged into my phone, but it's like 150 bucks. Um, you know, that'll improve your sound right off the bat, but then it's progressive. Like, I mean, at this point I have in my home, the ability to record high quality, you know, keys, vocal, guitar and I do stuff for myself and then I, I contract stuff for other people as well but that's been a process like I had to learn about mics and I had to learn about how to use logic which is recording software and I've just kind of done that slowly and gradually through the years but um before before I worried about recording anything I would just keep keep doing it and organically see if there are other people who, who are like, Hey, lead worship for our small group or sing at this thing or try some open mics, you know, or put stuff on your social media. I think all of that is, is going to precede recording. Usually when you get to the, the recording part, you've got a long period of like writing and getting better at writing under your belt. I mean, that's generally what I've what I see and what I've experienced. That's great, Lizzie. Thank you. And Marissa, maybe I could throw in just also, you know, an additional two cents. We do this thing at rehearsal room where we try and ask every student to record an entire song on a phone uh, on an app called GarageBand. And it's free. It's on, if you have like an iPhone like X and anything after that, like it's on there and you can create drums that sound way better than I can play drums for you. And you, it, you can create synthesizers and it's all right there. And we actually do a little zoom class that I can, that we teach you guys to do this. If any of you guys are ever interested um, and we can do it on zoom, you can come in if you want to do it. So I'm going to do this just, just cause you asked. And if anybody's interested, um, 
that's our website there. Shoot us an email if you're interested. If you feel like I feel like I'm stuck, you know, and and I'm gonna do what Lizzie said. I'm gonna start moving out into the community and and meeting people who can help me. But also, I want to be able to just have something I can start, you know, cheating with a little bit. It's a great way to cheat. So you can look that up. There's a little lesson thing we can get you started on, and I can help you with that. Okay, cool. Oh wait, uh, Victoria says healer is on Spotify. Yay. Okay. Um, that's what she says. Um, okay. So just a couple more questions. Uh, Cindy, would you agree that the first line of the chorus is the hook of the song? Let's talk about that, guys. For new songwriters, a hook of a song is basically something that is sticky. You know, it's something that it, it just doesn't go away. And let me give you an example of what a hook is. I want to take my mind down the old town road. I'm going to find them like it. I cannot begin to tell you how much that song is like a drill bit through my temple. And my son <laughs> loves it. And I can't get it out of my head. That's a hook. And if you're writing a song that doesn't really have one of those, it's hard to make it memorable. Healer is a really great song because it's got two really powerful hooks for me. Um, and Cindy asked uh, uh, Lizzie, essentially, Lizzie, in your mind, what's the hook? What's the stickiest part of the song? That's a good question. I, I don't guess I would say that Healer has a super strong hook, as in like it doesn't have something that repeats on every turn or something like that. But probably the first, yeah, probably the first line of the chorus, would you say? I don't yeah, um, th and uh, I would totally agree. I'm going to let you finish, and then it's going to get me to one of the points I wanted to make about the song. So, well, you continue, because I don't want to interrupt this time that they're getting to hear from you. But I, I do have a lot of things I want to teach about this tune. So go ahead. No, I was done. I mean, I, I, I would probably say the, the first line of the chorus. Well, so guys, real quick, let's do a quick little bit of songwriting math here. I'm going to put the tune back up here, and Lizzie – Please interrupt me because this is your song that we're talking about. Guys, let, let's look at this, this number thing here. What I want you to notice about Lizzie's chorus is uh, you're going to see some chords you probably recognize. We have an F, a C, F, C, A minor, F, C, and G. And these are how we number the chords in the music theory. And the cool part about this is it's just super repetitious. It's just four chords. And it's actually really just three chords. And then in the end, she kind of throws in this little thing to make us think about this last line. But that's, that's the song. Um, let's see if I've got my guitar here. I think this should be. Can everybody hear that OK? Lizzie, can you hear my guitar? Yeah. Yeah, so. We lift our song to you. Of our souls. And then she just does it again. Will you come and restore the things that have been lost? And so that it doesn't get so repetitive. We have no life. That would be the four again. And instead, she decides to kind of make it. She puts this minor in here. And it adds this flavor of reflection and complexity. Life except the life you give. And this kind of gets us back to where we were. Healer. And now we have a new thought and a new chord. Heal us. And that's it. So the reason I wanted to point that out about our course here is, again, don't be intimidated. It does not have to have eight chords in it. It can be something as simple as you noodling around on two chords and going back and forth. Now, the next part about it is for me, this bridge, which is very, very powerful, um, it opens up and we have more repetition because it takes us four measures to get through our chords. But in the same way, again, very simple, and that's what makes it beautiful. That's what makes it, how do I say, um, that's what captures us. 
So let me give you that analogy in return and nature because I was looking through Lizzie's Instagram and she has all these pictures of things that she sees on her walks. So in nature, nature is all about patterns and you see flowers and trees and it's just pattern, pattern, pattern. And that pattern starts setting in and it gives you a sense of rhythm and beauty. And that's the way songs should be. And then you'll see something in that pattern that you've never seen before. And that's the teaching moment. And that's what sticks out. And you can kind of begin to aim your songwriting in that way. One chord, second chord, one chord, second chord, new chord. And that will kind of arrive at, oh, that's that thing I want to point out. And that's what she does here. If you think about it, let's look at the, how that lines up with the lyrics. We lift our song to you, healer of our souls. Will you come and restore the things that have been lost? More information. We have no life except the life you give. And the most important part with the new introduced chord that we've never seen, healer, heal us. And that's kind of how it links up. Now, does Lizzie think of those things when she writes? Gosh, I hope not, because I don't. <laughs> it just happens. But that's the marriage. That's what you invite and open up to when you write a song, is you just kind of go, is this kind of thing going to come out of the musical universe or God or the guitar or wh wherever you are in your artistic and your faith and your spirituality or your practical thinking about music? let that be yours but just know that it's not just something you design you don't sit down and go i'm going to do this so all of this information i'm wanting to share with you guys today and that lizzie's sharing with you guys today is that these songwriting tactics are descriptive we're, we're describing what's happening but they can't really be prescriptive they can't tell you how to write a good song and you have to trust that the good songs in you and just kind of take some of these little rep tactics we're talking about and know that if you do them, it'll probably work out every now and then. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Okay, we got about five minutes here. So I'm going to kind of just read the rest of these questions. Maybe Lizzie can get through them. Sadly, we didn't get to get to the rest of the stuff. Um, but um, maybe, you know, Lizzie will come back and we can do this again because obviously we got a lot to talk about. Um, so uh, Lizzie, kind of quickly from Eric, is there a part of the songwriting process you find more difficult? Lyrics. Lyrics. 100%. Lyrics. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, sometimes it just flows and it's great. Sometimes it is, it's a six-year process. Um, just wrestling with, and, and the more you do, like, okay, so when you first start writing songs, if you're like me, it's like, you know, the tail is wagging you, and you're just hanging on, and you're like, maybe I can do something that makes a little bit of sense, and you feel like it's a miracle that you wrote a song. That's how it felt in the beginning, and, and half the stuff I wrote, or more than half, I didn't even really like. It wasn't anything I would listen to if it was somebody else, but it was just the best I could do in that moment. And then as you go, you, you sort of become master of it and you're now wagging the tail and you can go, I want to create this feeling and I know that this chord will do it. And, but it takes such a long time and such a lot of practice to get there. And it's still not, it still doesn't, it's a struggle and a, uh, there's just a lot of mystery in it. It's not like even still, I can't just, I mean, I could write something it would be lame maybe or it'd be great maybe but there's just this magic and mystery to it also that you can't force i mean you have to at least the really good songs i think um so it is it, it's it's part labor and part inspiration i guess um i don't know maybe some people would disagree and say you can totally just hammer out you know xyz and outcomes this great song but um i think there's there's more there's another component of something <laughs> yeah it's the x factor of the song and honestly yeah. if i can set everybody free today that's not up to you guys it's okay to write a song and it goes straight into what i call the crap can 
<laughs> and to know that is the purpose of that song. It was a yeah. rep. It was a morning jog and it gets you ready for the race. Yeah, and keep you, doing it. You, okay, that was it. That was my crap, that was my crap can song. Boom. Um, Lizzie and I have been part of a game that we have played before. Some people call it the game where we'll write a song every day based on a prompt, like a word, or every week based on a sentence. And those are things that, you know, she and I have done or she has done with other people, <laughs> kind of other people that kind of keep each other in shape and fun ways to just kind of write and creep shooting for the trash can and eventually a good song will come out. Um, so, yeah, that's really cool. Um, Victoria put something in here called the Fibonacci sequence, which I looked up. And I don't know exactly what this is, but it looks amazing. So we're, we're going to move past that. But Victoria, whatever that is, I'm interested to learn about that. Yeah, um, me too. Riley has a question about uh, the fact that, any, guys, we're going to talk a little te more technical here on the music theory stuff. So maybe for the more advanced students, you, I noticed that you used major sevens every time you play a C, your one chord. And then you bring back the major seven in the lead line after the bridge. What was the thought process behind that? Maybe I could tag on. I've noticed you love major sevens. Is that just a thing? Yeah, I do. I, I love that it's a little bit of tension. Um, I don't. I don't generally love just the straight up, you know, major triad sound. Uh, and, and especially for this song, I just love that. Da 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 da. -da. It's just kind of like, oh, okay. But when you have the in there it's like it kind of makes you go huh this song is about crying out for healing it's a confession of brokenness um it's it's coming from a place of i need you god i am a mess i am no i can't fix myself and so i didn't want just happy major chords you know i wanted and there are several you know, there's minor chords, but then just having that seven every time, it's like it, it, it won't let you just fully get into the major one. There's always the question. There's always like a, eh. so that was now the guys, thought. I want to kind of point something out that Lizzie's saying, and, and it's brilliant. Um, so if you, hopefully you can see my guitar here. You don't have to be a guitar player to understand this. What Lizzie's talking about is there are three notes that make up a major chord. We call those the one, three, and the five. There's also three notes that make up the minor chord. And in a major seven, we take two of those notes and they, they share them in common. So you now have four notes, two of which belong to each chord. And it sounds like this. And it gives it this complexity. Here's another example. And the thing I love about that is, and I'll sort of just kind of say this in short, sometimes music can be too, um, we're afraid of tension. We as people don't like to live in the middle of conflict or in the middle of an unresolved situation. And the thing I love about this song is again, whether it's intentional or unintentional, Lizzie and Matthew wrote this, giving people um, like myself, who I'm, I believe in God, I need the healing that comes from that relationship but I don't really understand him. I don't understand why he is seemingly distant sometimes. I don't understand why pain is around. And I use music to help process that. And this song helps me live in between the major and the minor. So I hope that's kind of cool how you guys can begin to see that. And the most important thing is I knew what those chords were long before I knew what music theory was. I just moved my fingers around. Mm -hmm. And you find it and you go, oh, that's super rad. And you play it and you're like, oh, yeah, it's this chord. And years down the road, you go, oh, that was a C major seven. I had no idea. And then totally. You to, yeah, you have to pretend that you knew music theory all along and you didn't. And that's okay. Um, yeah. I've even seen instructional videos from famous songwriters that I love 
call it. Yeah, you play this C-ish chord. It's like a C-ish <laughs> chord. And it's okay. So get on your guitar or your piano and start mixing the things you know just to see if you can make something new. And, and it hopefully... Okay. It we, the primary colors are good sometimes, but sometimes you need the fades. Um, anyway, I hope I didn't take that away from you, Lizzie, but I really wanted to point that out to everyone. Um, so uh, time signature on the song for you is 4-4. Four, four. Okay, so there you go. If you're looking for that. And actually, can I get William on here? Hey, William. Yes. How are you doing? William has a special gift. He's a savant. William, did you hear Healer? I did. Did you know the BPM when you heard it? Um, um, Would you have to think about it? We probably have to play it again. Okay, buddy, I'm going I'm to throw you in. You think about it. William can hear a song and know the exact tempo just from hearing it. Like the numerical wow. tempo. Yeah, so That's we'll be amazing. playing and he'll go 160 beats per minute. And like, I'm not exactly. Wow. Um, the next That's awesome. question I'm going to go to is Leanna Sky, and she's going to say it out loud. And then I think I'm going to let Lizzie have the floor um, uh, before I dismiss everybody. Leanna, how are you doing? What's up? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you can, okay, there's a background, sorry. Um, so sometimes when I'm working on a song, if I put all the lyrics in that I come up with, it would be like a 30 minute song. So how, <laughs> like, I don't know if you have that problem, but how do you decide how to pick and choose lyrics and when to just cut out lyrics or put it in a different song or um, anything like that? And also I love your songs. I was listening to them earlier and they're really um, uplifting. I, I really enjoy them. Oh, thank you for that. That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, if, if you, if you, any type of writing, if it's a song, if it's a poem, if it's a paper, an essay, you know, probably if you've done any school that you write and you rewrite and you rewrite and you cut and you condense and you focus and you say, well, I, I thought that originally, but now I don't think I really need it. So for sure, you have to kind of shape and, and make it fit into something you can sing. And really good songwriters can say a lot with a few words. You know, you just have a few words. Not me. And so that's a, that's a good. But, I mean, I, I have super wordy songs, and I have super simple songs. And they're, it's all good. Like, there's not a good and a bad. But I think we all, that's a challenge for, for me, too, is you got to condense, you got to focus. So you can ask yourself some questions like, is this helpful? Is this, is this saying what I need it to say? Or is it just making it kind of muddying the waters? And so, so you know, you just got to keep cutting and keep fitting it into something that can be sung and can be communicated. And, okay. But it's a process. It's, it's definitely a process. I'm glad we both have that problem. That's a, I thought I was the only one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Liana, remind me to, we'll meet tomorrow in our private lesson. I want to take, have you, we're going to look at songs from every decade for Bruce Springsteen. And you will notice how his lyrics get smaller as he gets older. Okay. Cool. In the 70s, freaking six and a half minute songs. <laughs> the healer and the beeler and the bounce out of the end. By the 2000s or by the 80s, it's, born in the usa yeah. so it's, you know it's really funny i look that forward happens. to that that's cool uh last question uh from cindy there are some really wordy songs these days and the singer sings the lyrics really fast oh oh yes yeah, sorry i hope you're not referring to me cindy um but <laughs> um so guys uh i i do want to say one thing we didn't get to today that i wanted to is that um, Lizzie has a fantastic new song called Better coming out. Is that right, Len Lizzie, do you know when that might be coming out? It is coming out Saturday, so three days from now. Guys, can we all just, you know, uh, I'm going to just say this out loud. Lizzie did this for free. She's got five kids. She still makes sandwiches. She's got worship to lead. <laughs> COVID crisis is happening. Dogs and cats everywhere, you know. <laughs> She agreed to do this. Can we just agree to uh, possibly follow Lizzie on Instagram if you enjoy her music or Facebook, listen to the song, and, and just say something on social media about it. Hey, guys, check out Lizzie Bailey's music. It was great. You know, or 
check it out on Instagram or I added, added, add her to a playlist, do something to help spread the music because for me, there's, there's not a lot of artists like Lizzie out there who do what she does for all the right reasons with the quality she does it. So, um, so guys, big video, round of applause so she can see you. Put your hands so she can see you. Lizzie, thank, uh, thank you again for having us. Uh, you, please give the last word. Is there anything that you want people to know about what you're doing with songwriting, where they can follow you, or how they can keep in touch with your music? Well, thanks so much for the kind words, Keaton. Sure, I, um, social media helps. Follow on Spotify, share. You know, if you like it, just tell your friends, whoever's in your circle, um, just share the music. That's I think that's the best way to help. But um, just keep doing what you're doing, guys. Uh, keep keep writing, keep growing, keep reading, uh, all, all these things that will just keep, as you develop as a person and, and become more human, you'll have more to say. And, and the more you say it, the better you'll get at saying it. So just keep going. Lizzie, thank you so much for that. Guys, if you were wondering, this is Lizzie's site and her full name, Lizzie Bailey. Follow her wherever you like to listen to music. And again, thank you so much for joining us, Lizzie. Have a great thank day, you. everybody. And uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. If y'all need anything, join us back next week, 2.30, 3.30 p.m. Uh, Songwriter Circle. We're going to have a guest on named Steve Saeed. He is the owner of Dosido, -Do, and he has written the lyrics for hit songs by Collective Soul, um, Sean Colvin. He has a really crazy story about how he went from a hobby poet to like a very wealthy lyric writer, and it just kind of happened. So it's going to be really neat to, to have him on. So I'll see you guys later. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll uh, hopefully see you in the future. Bye, everybody. Thank you again, Liz. Bye.